Hello guys, welcome back to another video. Today I'm trying to explain to you Dement and Kleitman's um, study on sleep and dreams. The paper is called um, The Relation of Eye Movements During Sleep to Dream Activity, an Objective Method for the Study of Dreaming. So this study was conducted in 1957 and it's the oldest study you have under the new AS level psychology syllabus. Um, before getting on with it, there are a few basic things that you should know about sleep. Uh, first of all, there are a few stages to your sleep, and uh, or you can say that there, are, there is a pattern to your sleep. And this pattern repeats every 19 minutes, or well, let's say roughly 19 minutes. So, if you attach EEG to your head while sleeping, you can see your brain go through a pattern of activities emitting different kinds of brain waves fall through. When awake, your brain produces these beta waves, which are high frequency waves. And then when you get drowsy and transition into sleep, you produce alpha waves. Have you ever felt like falling or hearing someone call your name and get up in a sudden jerky movement? This is called a hypnic jerk or hypnagogic jerk um, and this happens during this transition period. Now, uh, once you get into stage 1 sleep, your brain starts to produce these high amplitude theta waves, which is right here. Uh, and the sleep is light during this period and if someone wakes you up at this stage you might not even feel like you were sleeping and then you move on to stage two sleep which is a little bit more deeper and it might be slightly more difficult to wake you up at this point um, this is characterized by sleep spindles which are you know sawtooth like um, waves and a burst of activity and um, these K complexes are generally followed by these sleep spindles. Scientists are not really sure why we have these sleep spindles, but a research by Matthew Walker and his research team at the University of California, Berkeley, shows that these um, the sleep is associated with refreshment of our ability to learn. Um, now, at stage 3 and 4, the brain starts to produce delta waves, which are also called slow waves. And at this stage, the sleep is the deepest, and all of these stages are called as known REM stages. And, I'll, and let me explain to you why in a minute. Uh, but let me talk about the next stage of sleep, the final state of sleep, which is REM sleep or stage. Um, which is an abbreviation for rapid eye movement sleep. So what happens during this sleep is that your eyes move rapidly at this stage. Um, and uh, of course, under your eyelids, of course. Um, and this is a classic picture that has been, like, been, that has been circulating um, all around the internet for quite a bit. Um, so this is why this particular stage um, is called as... REM sleep because during this stage and only this stage your eyes move rapidly under your eyelids um, and and the rest of these stages are called non-REM stage because it doesn't happen during those stages right um, and an interesting aspect of this stage this REM stage um, is that you know, you have, during this period, you, are, you move on to a sleep paralysis where you cannot move your body at all. Uh, but the brain waves that are produced are similar to the ones that are uh, when you are awake, right? Which is, which is strange. Um, and the most important part of this is that it's the stage in which you dream. Okay, so the study we are looking at happened in 1957. So before that, Asrinsky and Kleitman in an earlier study had found that at a point during sleep, there is a rapid eye movement that is happening. And during this period, if a person is awakened, there is a high incidence of dream recall and it is happening at a regular interval. So they confirmed it in both normal as well as schizophrenic subjects as a part of a study that they conducted. And in 1957, um, Dimon and Kleitman, they tried to understand this relationship between eye movement and dreams in a more elaborate manner. 
So what are the aims of this particular study? They looked into a few things. Um, one is, is there a significant relationship between dreams um, and REM sleep, right? They also looked into the correlation between the length of your REM sleep and how long you dream. Also, the subjective estimate of um, the duration of dream and REM sleep. Uh, they also looked into the length of REM sleep and dream narrative. And finally, uh, the relationship between eye movement and the content um, of the dream. Uh, I'm going to come back to these hypotheses in detail once again. But until then, it's nice to have a rough idea on what's all this about, right? So who were involved in this study? Let's look at the sample. There were seven adult males and two females. Out of these people, five were intensely studied, while the other four were, were used to confirm the findings from those five people, right? Now, um, what they do with these subjects? The subjects came to the lab a little before their bedtime. They ate like normal, but abstained from alcohol or caffeine all day. Electrodes were attached to their um, eyes, near the eyes, to monitor the eye movement. Some electrodes on the scalp to monitor the brain movements. Now, when this is done, the subjects went into a quiet dark room and they would sleep there with um, these electrodes while their brain activities are being monitored. Now, let's go back to the first hypothesis. Uh, is there a relationship between REM sleep and dreams? Okay, so now the next question is how are they going to measure these two variables? That is, one is REM sleep and then the other one is dream, right? So to measure the first variable, of course, you have the EEGs connected to the subjects. So you'll get, an, get to know whether they are going through an REM sleep or a non-REM sleep. And to understand um, these dreams... What they did is that these participants were awakened with the help of um, a doorbell, a loud doorbell, um, and the participants were awakened and then they recorded their account of their dream. They were supposed to state whether they were dreaming and they would give an account of their dream. Now, they recorded it as a dream only if the participants were able to give a somewhat coherent, detailed description of what they saw. Different participants were awakened at different cycles of their sleep, some at REM sleep, some at non-REM sleep, some randomly, um, all of these things. Now, if you want to know the details of how many times each participant was awakened for how many nights, there is a table given in the original paper so you will get to know um, more about the same from there. And what they observed from this is that REM sleep periods were present for all the participants, which was low voltage and fast waves. And in between these REM sleeps, there were high voltage waves, um, high voltage slow waves, which are characteristic of deep sleep. It took the participants around five minutes to return back to sleep once they are awakened. Uh, they could not really, I mean, the researchers could not really appraise the duration of REM periods since they were awakening them in between these REM sleeps, right? But when they were not awakened um, artificially, it lasted about 3 to 15 minutes and it tends to be longer towards later in the night. And the eyes were not constantly moving throughout this period. Rather, it was like bursts of movements with fixational pauses. And the size of the movement and the pattern of the movement, these things varied from time to time. Now, let's look at the Second hypothesis, that is, is there a relationship, is there a correlation between 
dream recall and eye movement. So if you want to look into what correlation is and what are the different types of correlation, I have done a video on that so you can make use of it. But now let's see how they measure these two variables. Um, the eye movement, of course, was measured uh, with the help of EEGs. And to measure dream recall, um, they used a loud doorbell, which was placed right next to the bed of the subject to ensure immediate awakening. Then the subjects, as instructed, would speak to the recording device uh, right near the bed. They will state the content of their dream. And as I said before, only the coherent ones, uh, ones they could describe with somewhat, um, you know, in detail, will be recorded as dreams. Now, they were woken up either during REM sleep or at various uh, periods um, after the eye movement was completed, which basically means that during the non-REM sleep. They showed high incidence of dream recall when they were awakened during REM sleep and very low incidence of dream recall uh, when they were awakened during the non-REM uh, stages. So, and at times they were waken up uh, during the deep sleep as well, and whenever that happened, uh, they woke up with, uh, you know, all bewildered and anxious, uh, even though they could not relate it to any specific dream content. Um, now, another aspect the researchers were interested in was the uh, relationship between length of eye movement and the subjective estimate um, of these dream durations. So basically, it means that you wake someone up and ask them, hey, how long do you think you were dreaming? Now, what they did is they woke the subjects up at varying increments of time after the REM began. Um, but it seemed to be very difficult for them, uh, for the subjects to like pin pinpoint exactly how long long they had been sleeping, like to the minutes. Um, therefore, they changed the design um, and woke the subjects up either at five minutes or fifteen minutes, and they were asked to choose between these two options. What do you think? And this gave a much more um, of a success rate um, as in more of an accuracy uh, in their responses. They also looked into the length of REM sleep and the dream narrative for all the subjects. The number of words used to narrate the dream was considered as the measure of the length of na the narrative. So the recall after 30 to 50 minutes of REM and 15 minutes of REM did not vary much. But subjects felt like, oh, it was such a long dream when they were awakened after 30 to 50 minutes. But the narrative that they gave was almost the same. So this could be probably because by the time they are awakened, they are not being able to like remember the whole uh, 30 minutes of the sleep. So this might be one of the reasons why that happened. Last hypothesis, specific eye movement patterns and the visual content of the dream. They believed that the movements are a lot based on what and where the dreamer is looking at in the dream. Eye movements showed endless pattern of movements, but the researchers were interested in th only three, vertical movements, horizontal movements, both mixture of horizontal and vertical movements and very little or no movement at all. So these were the three types of movements that the researchers were looking into. So how did they do this? And every time they found one of these uh, movements uh, in the subject, they would wake them up and ask them uh, for what they just saw, what what were you just seeing right now? Turns out the horizontal movements are 
associated with things like throwing tomatoes at each other and vertical movements were associated with things like hoisting something or looking at a climber where the eyes need that kind of movement, okay? Uh, but those kinds of pure vertical or horizontal movements were very rare during the study. Um, while little or no eye movement was when they stared at something or was watching something happening at a distance. And this was very common in all these dreams. Analyzing 21 awakenings after a mixture um, of movements they found that it happens when the dreamer is looking at things that are close to them, uh, like talking to people or fighting or things of that sort. So these are um, the findings. I think with this, with this, we have come to the end of the video. I hope this helped. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share. Um, also, please like the video and also do not forget to subscribe if you haven't done that yet thank you so much and you have a great day